Very happy now to welcome in Syracuse coach Dino Babers to the 24-7 Sports Social Distance Chat. Coach, thanks for being on with us. Thanks, bud. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Just uh, continuing to, to hang out here at home and, and do, do, do distance work. Uh, just as, looks like you're, you're back in the office, right? Oh, yeah. We've been back since uh, June 8th. Uh, of course, we're practicing social distancing, and I'm in my own office. If not, I'd have my mask on, but uh, they're really serious about being uh, – mass correct and social distancing up here in the state of New York. And that, that, that's not just lip service. We, Coach, Coach Babers had his camera on, but the mic off before we started, and he was walking around with the mask on in his own office, so certainly taking it, taking it seriously. Uh, before we get into the football, I just doing my background research. I know you're a big movie guy. You had a little bit of downtime, I assume, during the quarantine period. Any, any new movies that you, uh, you recommend or you enjoyed? You know, I, I watched the uh, All-American, the uh, – it's, very, it's really unique because I actually recruited that young man at the time. I was at the University of Arizona, and uh, he really didn't go to UCLA. He actually went to the University of Oregon. But I remember him at Beverly Hills High School, and I remember the coach extremely well, and it's, it's a fine program. So it was fun watching that and reminiscing a little bit. Uh, my wife got me into Pinky Blinders, which was unique. But after you get the first season one, the first five or six shows, I'm going, ah, uh, and everybody kept saying, just stick with it, stick with it. It got really interesting. The, uh, I won't, there was some maid's tale or handmaiden tale that was some crazy ass stuff. I'm not sure I got the title right, but you need to go check that one out as well. The, the handmaiden tale? Is... Yeah, there you go, there you go. My, my wife watches it, yeah. <laughs> see, see, my wife turned me on to it. But I, I thought there was some unbelievable documentaries on, you know, Trojan War, the Roman Empire, uh, Civil War, you know, there was some, there were some really interesting documentaries that was, uh, and obviously the, uh, let me back up a bit, the last dance with uh, Michael Jordan. There were some interesting things that were on to watch during all that time. It's football time now, though. It, it, it is. And with that, what, what, a, what a segue. Co Coach is a, is a true pro on this. Uh, this is now your fifth, your fifth season in, in the ACC. You had a lot of success at Bowling Green and the Eastern Illinois, as well as you know, successful assistant stops along the way. What, what's something as, as someone who had not coached in this league before that, that has surprised you maybe about how good it is or, or about some things that needs to work? You know, one of the things that jumped out to me, I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've coached in the Big Ten, I've coached in the, the Big 12, I've coached in the Pac-12 when it was named the Pac-10. Uh, the, uh, the thing that amazes me about the ACC the first time around is how uh, explosive the edge rushers are. I mean, it's really a league of, of various sizes of, to me, elite pass rushers. And there, there's some cats that can come off the edge that can really stress a tackle out. And uh, it just reinforced, once again, that you need to have some good offensive tackles uh, to be able to do some of the things that you need to do to score a lot of points in this league because the edge rushers are so dynamic. I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of coaches over the years uh, who have come into the ACC and have asked them a similar question. And, Coach, that's almost always their answer. I, I don't know if it's maybe some of those guys who grew up being Carolina basketball fans in, in, you know, in the Tar Heel State and realized they were 6'5 and probably weren't going to make it in the NBA, so they need to put the hand in the dirt and you know, rush the passer. But you're right. Like, this league puts out really as, as much you know, defensive line talent as any league. You know, I had my, my son-in-law play for our 10-3 and three team uh, two years ago. And he started in the SEC, and you know, yeah, the SEC, you know, the league. But uh, it was really interesting. He came, he came over here, and he played in the ACC his last year. And after about the third game, I was like, "Hey, these pass rushers are a little bit different than the SEC." <laughs> of course, he wasn't laughing. I might not have been laughing on the field either, but. Uh, I thought it was a really good training ground for him. You know, SEC sometimes have a little bit more of those power type rushers and want to get physical with you, which is outstanding. But uh, this this league, those these guys can dip and they can run the hoop, and uh, just a, a little bit different style. I really think that the ACC uh, edge rushers maybe fit the NFL a little bit better than than maybe the other league. Not to take away from the other league, they have dynamic players and they always have the most draft picks and all that other kind of stuff. But uh, I really think this is a league to be reckoned with when it, when it comes to those defensive players we talked about. It's interesting that you're saying that everyone says the same thing. I haven't heard anyone say it, but it was the number one thing that jumped out to me when I came to this league is how good the edge rushers were. 
And I think to your point about the NFL, with with the league setting records for just more passing attempts every, every year, maybe that ability to play the run, not that it doesn't matter, but it might be diminished slightly relative to the importance of, of pass rushing you know, from that edge position there at, at the NFL level. Coach, you, you mentioned your 10-3 your and three season, obviously, that the high watermark so far for you at Syracuse. A lot of excitement about the program. You know, a dip last year, narrowly missed a bowl game. What, what track is Syracuse on? You know what? I think we're on a reload track. The one thing that I've always tried to do is I've always tried to win with other people's players. And when you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, guys come into a program, and, hey, we're going to clean all these guys out. It's going to take us two or three years to rebuild this thing. And then by year four or five, we'll have our guys in here and we'll win. Well, first of all, if you could look back to the last 10 years, I'm not sure college coaches get that much time to uh, reload and get an opportunity to show what they can do. So, I mean, I was, I didn't become a head coach till I was 50. I didn't become a, a, a division one head coach till I was 52 and I didn't get to the power five until I was 54. So the time is running out on me and I don't think people are going to be waiting around and giving me a lot of time. So I've, I've always tried to take pride on winning with other people's players, which means what do we have here? What do we got in the kitchen? How many eggs do we have? We got any vegetables? Let's find a skillet. Do we have, we don't have grease. Can we got some butter? Let's see if we can fry, fry this thing up and, and make and have something that, that's ed edible that we can eat. And so that was really important to me. I think that when guys lose over a long period of time, when I took over Eastern Illinois, they hadn't won for a while. I'll, I always feel like I owe it to those juniors and seniors, if possible, to, to try to figure out a way for them to taste winning before they leave college football. And uh, so I take pride in trying to create something out of nothing. Now, the BG situation was a different deal. You were taking over a championship team. Now, they had players, but they, had, they were a defensive team that we turned into an offensive team, and we had six there. The Syracuse thing was a little bit different. This was an option football team, and we wanted to be able to throw the ball and move at high tempo. So we really had a lot of turnover. We had a lot of turnover. And when I say that, I mean guys just leaving you know, just deciding that this wasn't the place for them. And then what was left was a bunch of hungry guys, but we had to figure out a way to win with them. And uh, it took a while, you know, four and eight, four and eight, had the big win over Virginia Tech our first year, the win over Clemson our second year. But we just didn't have the depth uh, to sustain it. And then uh, we stayed injury-free uh, for the uh, double-digit 10-win season, and, and, and the rest is history. You know, the five to seven year we had last year, we got banged up really quick in the offensive line and we can't recover. When, you, when you're growing your offensive linemen and you're growing your defensive linemen and you're the type of football team that we are, I mean, it, when you have major injuries at either one of those positions, it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough sledding. It's gonna be really, really difficult. And, uh, you know, I'm disappointed that we couldn't get to a six and six record and go to a bowl a bowl game, but we got a lot of young people who played in a five and seven season, and maybe that'll be to our benefit this year. Absolutely. I have to ask you about your quarterback, Tommy DeVito, one of my favorite recruits ever, uh, because at the opening four or five years ago now, uh, his dad actually grabbed my gear when the skies opened up, and I was on the other side of the field and made sure all my camera stuff didn't get wet. So I've always followed uh, Tommy and his career fondly uh, and in a great family, and I hope they're doing well. What, what kind of track is he on? I, obviously, a bounce back year is anticipated, I assume. You know, first of all, I think Tommy DeVito's got the greatest dad in the world. He's, he is old school, man. He is old school. I remember he came into my office and he told me some things. And I said, Mr. DeVito, you know how many people I've had in my office that says stuff like that, but, but they don't mean it? He says, Coach, that wasn't me. If I say something's going to happen, it's going to happen. I said, well, I'm going to have faith, belief without evidence that that's true. And sure enough. I mean, that young man took off in the Elite 11 and, and everybody in the world started coming after him after he committed to us. And Mr. DeVito was having none of that. He is old school and, and true to his word. And I've always appreciated, I've always appreciated people like that, but I'm always gonna give a, a shout out to, to someone that uh, says what he means and means what he says. And uh, Mr. DeVito is definitely like that. I thought that Tommy last year, he, he was in a really difficult situation. You know, he got hurt early in the Clemson game. And he basically had to pay, play with that the entire year and uh, did a, just a fantastic job playing through pain. And it was one of those things, you got to know the difference between injury and pain. And he, he was in pain. He was not injured. 
but uh, you know, he had to go through some tough situations. And when you put that out there, him playing through that injury, along with the amount of injuries that we had on the offensive line, it was not going to be a pretty picture. But uh, he's going to bounce back from all that. In fact, I just saw him this morning. I'm going to let a little, let some news out. I, I just saw him this morning on video because, you know, we got to stay away from those guys because of COVID-19, you know, hit 365 for two on the bench. And I'm sitting there going, 365 for two? Holy moly. I'm, that's as strong as I was. I was getting ready to go to the pros. And I'm sitting there going, this is, I said, okay, now, that's a lot of muscle. Now let's stop, stop lifting so much and let's throw the ball a little bit more. But I'm telling you what, he has really changed his body. He, he's really swollen up and uh, he's getting his body ready to be able to take those shots and, and be the leader that we want. I told him that there was one movie he had to watch during the pandemic. And I said, it was Ford versus Ferrari. And I said, I want you to drive, I want you to run our offense the way that guy drove that Ford. And I want you to know everything about that car the way he knew everything about the car. Now, I didn't tell him at the end of the movie that the guy crashed <laughs> and died and his son watched him die. I didn't tell him that part. But the first hour and 58 minutes of the movie was big time, and uh, we expect big time things out of him. So speaking of car crash, man, Coach, you are just on the segues today. We didn't go over this, this before, before we shot. What had to be about 10, 12 years ago now, you were on a recruiting trip and ended up head on facing the semi, I believe in Dallas or Houston, I read. You know what? You've done some homework, bud. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Yeah, it was one of those moments where when, you know, I survived a car accident and then I'm sitting there going, in fact, the other people came up to me that saw the accident and said, you shouldn't have survived that. And I'm sitting there going, I shouldn't have survived that either. It was one of those moments that, uh, you know, that changes people's lives. And I think it had an effect on me. There's no doubt. So let's talk about Jimmy G real quick. Obviously, I had to be pretty proud to see him. You know, go to the Super Bowl last year with the 49ers. When you had him at Eastern, did you know he was going to be that big time? Like you had a guy at, at the level of Eastern that was going to be, you know, high level NFL quality. And if so, when did you know? You know, when I got there, it's really interesting. We had some administrators that thought that he was overrated and thought that, uh, you know, we had a better quarterback uh, on campus than him. And, you know, I had just got there and they, they, they wanted me to, you know, we had a kid that could run a lot better than Jimmy. Jimmy could. And was like, you need to get the runner in there and scramble around and all that kind of stuff. And I said, that's your offense. I'm like, well, that's not really my offense. I mean, like, you know, the offense is set for a pocket quarterback. It's really a throw more than run offense. It's just, if the guy can run, it just makes it a little bit better, but you don't really look for that. So anyway, instead of throwing him off the team, we let him go through spring ball. And, uh, you know, Jimmy threw about five passes on the very first day of the spring ball. And I'm standing there going, this guy shouldn't be here. And then the person that had said that said, that's what I'm talking about. The other guy's better. I said, I didn't say that. I just said, he shouldn't be here. I said, there should be about 40 division one coaches that should get fired. There's no way this guy should be at one double A level. And I had just left RG three at, at Baylor and he had just won the Heisman. And I'm sitting there saying, this guy shouldn't be at this level. And uh, the rest is history. I mean, we, he had a really good uh, junior year. There's no doubt about it. We, won, we were picked to take last. We won the conference championship. And then we lost early in the playoffs. And then we came back the senior year and we opened up with a San Diego State team that actually won their conference. And they were uh, 21 points favorites. And we went out in Charger Stadium. I still call it, it's Jack Murphy Stadium. They call it QuamCom, but I'm old school. It's Jack Murphy. And, uh, you know, we were supposed to, lose by 21 and I think we won by 19 or something like that and uh, it was all it was Jimmy G and uh, the rest is history now I will say this because I don't like I, I'm not trying to throw people underneath the bus the administrator was right the other guy was good he was so good we moved him to tailback and he actually scored a touchdown as a tailback in that game against San Diego State he was a good runner but uh, we were better with both of them on the field than just one of them being on the field Coach, we've been talking to a lot of coaches out, out here, and they're, they, all, they all have a lot of different thoughts on recruiting and, and on the challenges of recruiting during this time. I'm sure you know, for y'all, y'all recruit your region, but also nationally. You probably haven't been able to have a whole lot of players visit you before the shutdown, right? We really haven't. This, is, this has been the most unique year of recruiting in the 34 years I've been in recruiting. And uh, now you understand when I started recruiting, first of all, to make a telephone call, you had to get out of your car 
and you had to go to a phone booth. Now, some people may have to Google that or ask Siri or Alexa what I'm talking about in this podcast, but uh, that's how we started. And then we had the giant army 1942 walkie talkie phones where the battery was bigger than my face to, to power the whole thing. And now we've got these telephone, these telephones where you can talk called FaceTime and we've got these things called Zoom. So uh, it's been very unique, it's been very different, but I think with the Zoom calls and, all, and FaceTime and all that kind of stuff, it made it a little close to normal. But it's been very unique because these guys have not really stepped on campus unless they came up on their own time and did it. How big of a challenge has it been for you to get verified measurements and times on kids? I know everybody is data driven to a certain extent and you know, us on the 24 seven sports side, like we, we go to the camps, but there are not many camps this year. And we're kind of like, wait, is this kid, is he really six, four? His high school coach says he's six, four, but on tape, he doesn't really look you know, six, four. It, how have y'all attacked that challenge? Or has it been a challenge for you? It has been a challenge. What you try to do is you try to find somebody on the team that you know exactly how tall they are and then try to catch them in a game where they're standing next to each other and freeze it and go, okay, now how tall is this guy? Or you know exactly how tall the high school coach is because he'll tell the truth. And then you try to catch the kid next to the high school coach and, and you compare his height. And, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that stuff matters. And, but if, it's, if the guy is a really, really good player, an inch, an inch and a half is not going to matter, you know. Now, three inches and four inches, that does matter. But when you're talking about an inch, inch and a half, it really doesn't matter. The better you are, the less we're going to look and see how, how tall you are or how, or how short you are. Given the, the likelihood that a lot of high school seasons are, are going to be moved uh, to, to the spring, I mean, it, we're seeing it in some states already. Would you be in favor of pushing back either early signing period or traditional signing period, maybe to, uh, to like April or May to make sure we can get in, you know, all these high school seasons and actually see the kids play their senior years? You know, see, this is where, this is where I'm going to, um, ooh, this is a fantastic question. I'm not, I'm not stalling for the answer. I'm trying to make sure I don't get fired with what comes out of my mouth here. So this is all about job security. This has nothing to do with the answer. Okay, this is how, this is how I'm going to answer it. If, if our season got moved back, I don't think the NFL would move the, the, uh, the combine back. The NFL is the NFL, and they're going to do what they want. And, you know, we may have issues with guys playing, not playing, and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think the NFL would move for us because I think the guys that want to go to the NFL – already know they can go and and they're going to do what they need to do I don't think it would be in our interest to move the, the signing date back I think there's players who already know where they want to go and regardless of whether they play their high school season is up to them but for them to say hey I want to go to school a my dad went there uh, because of the COVID-19 I don't want to go far away from home I want my parents to be able to see me and and this is where I want to play if they know where they want to go I think you should let them go. That's the reason why we have two signing dates. Now, that second signing date, if they haven't played their senior year, that might be negotiable. Or maybe you take the first signing date, move it to the second signing date, and then take the second signing date and move it after the season. But I, I do believe that there should be something between December – in February where a guy can say, this is where I want to go to school. I know where I want to go to school. I'm going, or I want to go to this school and I want to sign early. Just like there may be players that may not play. If we got everything moved back, there may be players that may not play their senior years in college. Well, you know, that same thing could happen in high school. There may be players that say, you know what, I'm good enough as a junior to go to school. So-and-so maybe I early enroll and I don't play my senior year. No high school coaches don't want to hear that. Well, College coaches don't want to hear that either, that the NFL is going to do that to our guys. But I don't – I think there, there needs to be a place for guys that are getting calls, 100 calls a night from schools all over the country, and they already know where they want to go, to just eliminate all that stuff, cut the umbilical cord and say, hey, I'm going to this school come blah, blah, or water. So let's end this thing and then let's go. And then there's another signing date for guys that are still trying to prove their worth or maybe try to – improve their grade so they can get to another school too the long for you to answer no no i i think it's it's appropriately nuanced right you, you the guys who have their minds made up can go in december and for the guys who sign in february they're not early enrolling anyway there's not really any harm of mm -hmm. letting them see what all their options are and letting the schools get a better feel for you know for who they are as players and I, 
I just hope that we can get a season if we can get it, you know, done done safely and, and in a way that it works with, the, with with all the regulations. So, Coach, really appreciate you being on with us on the twenty four seven Sports Social Distance Chat and taking the time. And, and best of luck to you this year, whether it's uh, in the fall or in the spring. Hey, Bud, thank you so much. I I did go back and watch some of your other podcasts. You do a fantastic job. You know, I I, I guess I fit right in, I fit right in there. I'm like, wow, man, he, he's interviewed a lot of guys. I'm like at the end of the list. <laughs> I must be the last. One. <laughs>